was busy too. Okay, hey, everyone, it's uh, just a minute or two after one, so we'll get started. Um, my name's uh, David Hoskin. I'll be the uh, MC for this particular meeting. So welcome, everyone. Uh, next slide. Uh, begin with the uh, uh, Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. Rask uh, Halifax Center would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship with Mi'kmaq and Malise peoples, first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq MLC title and established the rules of what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Start, please. Uh, the RASC and the RASC Halifax Center believe in and practice inclusivity and diversity. All are welcomed regardless of age, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage, and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, ethnic origin, color, nationality, national origin, relief or belief, or sex and sexual orientation. Uh, we are opposed to all forms of unlawful and unfair discrimination. So today's program uh, is up here. We've gone through the uh, welcome uh, to members and those of you in Zoom land that are attending remotely. Um, next up will be a photo montage followed by our uh, feature presentation by Chris Young. Then there will be a 15 minute social break followed by members presentations, uh, Paul Heath's Food for the Soul. And uh, I'll go over uh, what's up in the October skies, uh, ending with uh, Peter Hurley's uh, news from the board. You may have noticed we're uh, introducing a new session uh, in the agenda called members presentations. Uh, the point of this was to uh, allow people to share an oh wow moment from viewing the summer or, or an equipment review or a book review. Uh, if anyone's struggling with a new piece of equipment or has something broken, try to uh, we'll, uh, see if there's someone who has found a fix for it. Uh, new members are old, you can introduce yourself, uh, tell us about your interest in astronomy and the Halifax Center or your expectations of membership. Uh, no slides are needed. Uh, just a minute or two is fine, but you can uh, take up to 10 minutes. Uh, this is part of the uh, an ongoing discussion by the uh, board of directors uh, regarding how we can get more members engaged or uh, re-engaged in the center and its activities. Um, we've had a, a tough couple of years with the pandemic uh, and uh, the introduction of Zoom into our uh, communication strategy. And then this summer we've had forest fires, floods, hurricanes, uh, pretty much you name it, we've, we've encountered it. Uh, so we thought we'd try something new. And, uh, this is going to be the launch of this activity. Depending how it goes, uh, we may do this, uh, you know, every meeting, every few meetings, we just have to see. Okay, next slide. All right, so photo montage. Uh, this is a shorter montage than normal. Um, as you know, the weather uh, in September wasn't great, uh, but if a few of us got out and, and took some pictures that uh, I can share with you. Slide. This is a neat one. Um, Roy Bishop posted this. Uh, it was taken by his grandson, who's a co pilot on, uh, I forget the airline, I think it was Air Canada. Uh, he was in a Boeing 737 cockpit and he captured this uh, image of the Northern Lights over uh, British Columbia uh, with his uh, uh, cell phone camera. Pretty, pretty impressive image. Uh, Jerry Black uh, took this image of the uh, Elephant's Trunk Nebula in September, and I think Jerry's got another image coming up. Which is the elephant? I was trying to figure out what part is the elephant trunk, but what, what actual <laughs> part of the nebula is. You want to flip back? Jerry? If I can. I have no idea. But I always <laughs> assume this is the trunk. <laughs> That's well, what I thought. Yeah. yeah. You can imagine a head there with ears and the trunk coming down. Yeah. So, to me, it's upside down at the moment. Oh, um, very well. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Never mind. Anyway, to me, it looked more reasonable upside the other way around. Right? How many were clouds? 
Um, and this is uh, the uh, monkey's head nebula. Who can center it? Okay. It looks like a head. I don't know if it's a head. Michael Blasha uh, took this image of uh, the moon showcasing uh, crater Tico and the southern lunar islands. Hanging out of his eighth floor. Hanging out of his eighth floor window. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he does. Jeez. And I think he used his uh, Tal 75 uh, millimeter refractor. Sets the bar pretty high. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Michael also uh, got these pictures of the harvest moon uh, towards the end of September, both rising and setting, uh, rising over, I guess that would be over the, the bridges, looking towards Dartmouth and, and uh, setting uh, as well. He's struggled with the apartment buildings in front of his line of sight, but uh, gets around it. And uh, the Largeman is uh, is in the uh, upper right. Another shot of this. It's nice shots from Michael. Again, leaning out of this apartment building. Uh, this is a uh, very gorgeous. Yeah, thanks. Very <laughs> uh, took this picture of uh, the moon a couple days before uh, full moon. And uh, Barry captured this image of Comet Nishimura um, right. back right. in uh, on September 8th. Nice, nice uh, wide angle view. Next one, please. And uh, this is another one from Barry uh, Venus and the zodiacal, morning zodiacal light. So, Barry got up. Uh, Early uh, to take this image, and uh, you can see uh, Venus sitting almost uh, just off to one side of the uh, pyramid of the, made by the Zodiac light. And Barry wrote while he was um, imaging the Zodiac light, uh, he thought uh, there might be a bit of aurora activity going on, so he pointed his camera northward and uh, took this picture. So some early morning aurora borealis. Uh, Jason Danes managed to be busy. Um, this is a really nice image of the fireworks galaxy and the ghost bush uh, open star cluster. I don't think I've ever seen a picture of these objects with so many stars in them. What was his target? It was long. He's been doing really long, like 30 hours. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's doing uh, monochrome uh, RGB luminous filters, but still a lot of, a lot of exposure. Next one, please. Uh, W63 from Jason again. This is a supernova remnant. See the, the blue reflection nebulosity uh, in the middle. It's the remnant. This was. And uh, the Dumbbell Nebula. Jason. Uh, and this is a really long exposure and, and interestingly when you do the long, long, long exposure like this, uh, it's hard to see the dumbbell shapes. Because <laughs> he's brought out all this all this surrounding nebulosity because they don't normally see the shorter <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, next will be sir. Uh, this is one I took uh, back in uh, towards the end of September when there was a lot of sunspot activity. Uh, so this is a uh, White light uh, image of the sun and uh, a uh, magnified uh, view of uh, AR3435, which is the uh, largest sunspot. That's good theory. Uh, these are my uh, shots of the harvest moon uh, rising over Halifax Harbor, and he uh, uh, taken uh, with a different telescope and camera of the uh, full moon later on in the uh, evening. I also uh, had a shot of getting a comet Nashimura. Uh, and uh, this image I got with my dwarf too. Which is the dwarf two? Is that where Mars hangs and talks? Uh, the dwarf two is, is uh, I found it here. It's a little robotic telescope. Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like. Yeah, no, no. Galaxy. Oh, yeah, no, that's. Uh, oh, right. The yeah, so. Uh, I think I, I stacked a bunch of raw images from the uh, the dwarf. Well, that's what you had to shoot. Yeah. Next, please. 
And uh, I took this with my uh, Red Hat 51 of uh, Seder and Cygnus and some of the surrounding nebulosity. Uh, Blair McDonald uh, spent the summer at his cottage and got a nice shot of uh, NGC 6820 in Volpecula. Next one, please. Uh, this was Blair's uh, long, uh, I guess, long exposure project for the summer, uh, the Ring Nebula. I forget how many hours he did it, but it was 20 or 100. Was it over 100? Was it, or was it over 20? Well, either one, it's a loss. <laughs> I think it's more like 20. But I'm right, yeah, sure. which is a little funny for Blair because yeah. he always says you don't need super long exposures to their integration times to see stuff. But uh, he wanted to capture uh, the, the uh, nebulosity outside the, the uh, major part of the nebula, which is often hard to get. And next one, please. Uh, Tom McIntyre. Uh, also, uh, an owner of uh, owner of the uh, Dwarf Two Mini Robotic Telescope, and he took this image of the Hercules cluster. Next, uh, I think this last one for the photo montage. Thoreau Singh uh, has been uh, working on a mosaic of the Cygnus region, and uh, so I guess this is a, a bit of a work in progress, um, but uh, it's a pretty impressive uh, mm. impressive image. And uh, that's it. So uh, next up is Chris's presentation. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christian, and I have an interest in uh, kind of armchair astronomy, um, which, when you live in Nova Scotia, is a useful pastime to fall back on. Uh, and I present periodically, um, often sort of indigenous stories and things that. Uh, because I find them of interest and I chase them over the internet and, and uh, use it as an excuse to buy books. Um, and so today I, I periodically bump into things um, about the moon in terms of stories about the moon or, or images on the moon. And so today it's going to be the man in the moon edition. Um, and people will have to remind me if I, I tend to lose my voice. So if I start to get quiet, just as, as Dave did, point to the sky and I'll work on it. So our first slide here is, uh, this is a, from a 1902 uh, black and white, originally black and white um, movie, uh, no sound. Um, you, can, you can see it on, uh, on YouTube. It's, it's fun to watch, 17 minutes, I think. And it's loosely based on uh, Jules Verne, um, and but yeah, from the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne, and the First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells. And the the uh, they had only fairly recently discovered or rediscovered a uh, a colored copy of this, and the colored copy is every frame is hand painted, and they had, there were two hundred women in France, each with one color that that painted these these number all these frames in a, in a number of editions. Anyway, worth watching. Um, the, the reason the song repeats here is one, it's because it's fun, and, and two, it's because culturally we're interested um, in the moon, and most of us see a face in the moon, and as kids, we talk about the man in the moon, I think, so, anyway. So, uh, we've got uh, RAC, RAC says, uh, provides us with, a, with a, little, a little moon map card, and down along the bottom, you've got some, some, some figures that perhaps you can see on the moon. And I sort of was a bit disdainful of, of those figures when I first saw them, but um, they're uh, actually I've come to appreciate them as you'll soon learn why. So seeing a figure on the moon, be it a, 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 an animal or a figure or creature, is a, an example of pareidolia. And that's where you, your, your mind is looking for patterns and it tries to find things, particularly those things that you're kind of interested in. Um, and it's kind of, it becomes a, you know, sometimes a source of inspiration. Leonardo wrote about how this was an, a source of inspiration for artists, that they could look at a stone wall and they could find all kinds of things that they could, that would, you know, add life to something to their painting. So, um, and it's, uh, this is one part, this is a visual part. It's, this also happens, I guess, with, um, with computer data and stuff, like it, they, everything, anywhere they go searching for, for meaning when there isn't any sort of. So um, looking to see how far back this goes, this is a, uh, a funeral banner 
or Lady Di. She um, passed away in the second century, I think, BC. Um, this was on, there was, she had a series of nested coffins. This was on one of the coffins. Um, it's, it's hand painted. Over on the right hand side, there's a black and white where they've, they've drawn the, the, uh, the artwork, if you will, that's on the original, uh, the original banner. And the, I guess the academics still discuss whether this is a, we have the underworld and then we have the human realm and then we go back to heaven. But anyway, that's all under discussion, I guess. What I'm interested in is um, up in the, in the top, top left here. I guess the cat toy doesn't work, it's not strong enough. Um, anyway, next one, please, the slide. So <clears throat> over on the top right is what you would see, if you will, in, on the, the top of the banner. And um, down below is the, the, the same portion, only in the black and white um, copy. And you can see that there's a, a toad and sort of standing kind of on the crescent of a moon, and then above that is a rabbit. And that's also, if you search for it, visible um, in, the, in the upper sort of silk version. Now, I've made a little try here at trying to find a toad on the moon. And the, what's it's discussed in the books is the fact that, that the toad is a negative image on the moon. Typically, we look at the dark areas to be a creature or a face. And in this case, it's been suggested that the uh, that, the, that the lighter colored areas are, are outlined the toe. Um, anyway, that's uh, kind of an attempt. Just hold on uh, for a second, okay? Yeah. We're not seeing the screen in Zoom, although it says I am screen sharing. Can you, can you back up one, Jerry? Um, anyway, just so a, a, a quick recap, funeral banner of Lady Di, second century BC, Black and white over on the right hand side. We're interested at the image, the portion of the image that's in the, the top left. Next slide. And there's a blow up here on the on the top right is the kind of what's the silk off the original, which is not bad for 2,200 years. And then below that is a drawing of the same art. And it shows a toad, and the toad is on that standing essentially on the kind of the crescent of a moon. And then there's a, a rabbit above that. There is a rabbit also in the uh, in the top right as well. Now I made a little attempt here to, to find a toad and the books that I heard that referenced it mentioned that the toad was, was essentially um, outlined by the dark areas and that it's actually the negative image, if you will, on the moon that forms the toad, but it's, uh, it's, a, hard one, it's a hard one to find. Uh, at the same time period, 200 BC or so, um, in, this is in uh, Southern India, uh, at a Buddhist monastery, these are stone carvings, and they're telling a, uh, uh, it tells a, a Jakarta tale, which were animal stories that the Buddhists use for teaching. And in this case, the, the characters are in here, and you, you can see on the bottom right, there's a rabbit, a monkey, um, and that's either a, a, a fox, I think, and an otter. Um, and <clears throat> these characters are, um, they, <clears throat> They're, they're wanting to practice acts of charity. And uh, so to test them, um, I guess the, the gods sends down a essentially a beggar who, who says he's hungry and he needs to have food. So the animals all go off and get some of their favorite foods to bring for the beggar. But the, the rabbit brings his, realizes he only has grass. That's his favorite food. And that's the humans don't eat that. So he realizes that what he has to do is he has to sacrifice himself so that the beggar could, could, could eat the rabbit. And so he tells, her, tells the beggar, you know, if you start a fire, I'll jump into it, and then, then you will have food. So the, the beggar makes a fire appear quite quickly, and the rabbit looks and jumps, goes to jump into the fire, but is lifted up by the beggar, who then, you know, <clears throat> recognizes his, his sacrifice, um, doing this without hesitation, and said, oh, I'm, going to, I'm going to put your image on the moon for all to see for a long time. And so what we have uh, up here is the, is that's the rabbit jumping into the flames. I think we have a monkey, otter, uh, maybe the fox. Anyway, so this is sort of the, the same time period as we have Lady Di, uh, that, that banner of Lady Di. Next, please. So here's a couple of rabbits on the moon. 
Now the one on, again, I apologize for, for the, uh, the, the crude sketching. Um, the one on the left is really the jade rabbit and you'll find other images of this. And what happens is that the jade rabbit is making um, an elixir of immortality. Um, the other rabbit, I've called it the kind of the pet rabbit. I, I've seen that drawn a couple of times, but I, it, I don't think it, it fits in with any of the stories that are used. So the story of the jade rabbit, which also goes back to the toad, is that um, there was a, a, uh, a woman, Changi, who took a, a pill that gave her immortality, much longer introduction to that story, uh, as all of most, most of mine will be today. And anyway, she lifted and floated off and went to the moon. When she was at the moon, she coughed up the husk of the pill, which was the white rabbit, keeper who kept her company. And then later she ate, she drank some of the mist that was there on the moon and she turned into a toad, which is where the toad comes from. The toad is associated with longevity, um, perhaps immortality. It's also associated with water because there's a lot of connection between the moon and, and moisture and water and tides and things in our earth. So this is the jade and the jade rabbit is pounding in the Chinese version is pounding is making the making the elixir, making the medicine. Right. So so over on the, the right hand side, we have the, the jade rabbit making the elixir. On the left hand side, we have a Japanese, uh, essentially the same story. These these stories made their way across um, from Japan about through Korea, excuse me, from China into Japan and from Korea. That they these all got traded around. And that's from a from a, a, a temple, a seventh century temple in Japan. Next, please. So <clears throat> these are 16th, 17th, and 18th century um, prints from Japan. And the, the, the author in the paper this came from was trying to determine when was the date that the Japanese stopped making elixir on, on you know, the, the, uh, the pill of immortality on the moon. And changed it to making rice cakes, and they would, which they essentially made candy for for their festivals. And it's and, it, and the argument goes back to the the uh, the container that's being worked on here. So we have more of a bucket, which is more of what they would use for for dealing dealing with rice. Um, and I here I'm just indicating that the pattern that you see on the moon did, is is just a large degree determined by the latitude of where you're viewing from. And these aren't the most uh, highly legible ones, but in the northern hemisphere, I'll call it the uh, the jade rabbit tends to be high and, and, and almost at the top of the moon, and um, down the very down at the south pole, he's on the bottom of the moon. In at the equator, in the morning when the moon comes up, the jade rabbit is sitting upright. When the moon goes down at night, the jade rabbit's standing on his ears. Right, so it it depends. The, uh, so this is uh, this is actually lifted this one from the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand, uh, their website. Anyway, it has some sublimation, but here you see the moon is the, the rabbit is down more towards the bottom, whereas if, if you look out, you can see it more towards the top. And uh, it will almost be good to go back to uh, Mike Boschat's picture in a way because it was visible there. I've become a little more a little more aware of this. Um, next. Now, I was initially I was just a bit disappointed when I was taking taking <clears throat> large pictures of the moon and I was trying to find the creatures and maybe outline. And then I realized, you know, the full moon is not very big, right? It's half a degree. You can cover it with your little finger, right? So that's my little finger down at Keji, and then over on the right hand side, slightly enlarged. I've dragged over a full moon and and approximated the same size as the image. And you can see, you know, there's not a lot of detail there. So there's lots of room for interpretation and imagination. Um, those who are really sharp and read the text will notice that I'm indicating the latitude of where these things are viewed from. This one is from New Zealand, which is at latitude 36 south. And it's the story of Rona. She's the, the tide controller. Father is one of the gods, and Rona is out one night, and she's going to get water. She's got a big gourd, 
and she's uh, she's getting water for her three kids, and she's and she's wandering in the dark, and the moon suddenly slips behind a cloud, and then she can't find her way, and she stubs her foot on a big tree root, and so she curses the moon. Well, that's not a good thing to do in their culture. And the moon gets very angry at this and reaches down and grabs Rona and pulls her pulls her up. She tries to grab the Nagayo tree um, and to hang on to that, but he's, he's ir I mean, there's irresistible force as the tides might show you. Um, and so the, <clears throat> and the tree or, <clears throat> or likely large bush gets ripped out um, with her. And so she's up, uh, <clears throat> that's how she, how she came to be up on the moon. Um, I'm sure that they have a different idea of what she looks like than that. But anyway, gives you gives you a bit of an idea. But 36 south, so the the, the the if you will, the Jade Rabbits kind of slides more down towards the bottom. This is from the Florentine Codex, which was an encyclopedia that a um, <clears throat> a, a brother assembled in uh, Mexico, in the, I guess it the Mexican area, uh, 1577, I think was when it was published. It was, has like 12 volumes, one of which is, is devoted sort of to the sun and the moon and the creation. And uh, the, the creation story that we have, and I'll probably have to flip through in order to get the pronunciation correct. Anyways. There, there were um, before there was there was a day there, there weren't any suns. So the gods get together to create a sun, and they said we're going to need a sacrifice. We're going to need we're going to need like two gods to sacrifice themselves to create this sun. And so, you know, one god steps forward, being kind of buff. Oh, yeah, I can do that. I'm no problem. And uh, and so they look around. They say, well, are there any, is there anybody else? And everybody else sort of steps back because somehow they're kind of frightened of the idea. The idea of jumping into a fire. So, um, so they look at one an, another one of the gods who's a, a, you know a far less stature, and instead of being being kind of a big buff god, he's covered with sores. Like it's, it's, it's a bit pathetic. But he says, "Yes, I know. I'll go along with that." So the day comes. They have to do some self, some prep, preparation. Um, some of which is kind of a um, self uh, self punishment. You know, they stick things in their skin, a whole bunch of things. They're pretty, um, the, the culture is a bit bloodthirsty at times. Anyway, it comes time to go into the fire. The big buff god, he, he can't make himself jump into the fire. And he has kind of sort of five attempts, and the other gods are getting angry with them. Our, our other god, the, 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 uh, the, the, well, the lesser god, without hesitation, jumps in. And then the other god, feeling the buff god, feeling ashamed, also jumps in. But what happens is that this creates two suns because there were two. It didn't happen at one time. And so what the other gods, the, the gods that are, are there, do is they say, "Well, we can't have two suns. That's too bright." So what they do is they take a rabbit and they throw it in into the, if you will, the face of the sun, which is the buff god, to diminish the amount of light that comes from. So that's how. That's one of their stories. There is, there's also another story, which is, again, God's visiting, walking on the earth. This is very hungry. Rabbit says, I'll sacrifice myself to feed you. And at the last minute, the rabbit is rescued and said, you know, I'm going to put your, your image on the sun, on the moon, rather, for all times for people to see. So, and, and these stories go back pre-Columbus. So it's, it's kind of odd how they, they show up. The, the, the Quran does not forbid people making images of things that are alive. However, the practice is, and I guess it gets interpreted, that that's that only 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 God should be the one that creates that creates things that are alive. So there's there's most of Islamic art is sort of is geometric or patterns, but it's not. It's not kind of copying things from nature or people, um, though, though there are, though they sometimes the artists sometimes get around that by being clever. But in this case, we have the. They say that you can read the name Ali in the moon. Now this apparently says Ali, and I had to crop it a little bit to make it kind of moon-like. 
he was the son-in-law of Muhammad, Muhammad in the seventh century. And there's so there, and, and this is kind of uh, explains be explained by the fact that there's an Islamic saying that Muhammad was like the sun and Ali was like the moon. And I suspect they there were other customs that saw figures in the moon. And kind of just like the Christians who went around erasing all the all the evidence from those that came before them that that could well have been happening. So this story is um, is from South Africa, and I'm I'm going to read it. It's not that long. It's one of the ones that I like. So in the beginning, the sun married the moon. They traveled together for a long time, the sun leading and the moon following. As they traveled, the moon would get tired and the sun would carry her for three days every month. On the fourth day, the donkeys are said to be able to see the moon. People can only see the moon on the fifth day. It's a curious thing you put in the story. One day, the moon made a mistake and she was beaten by the sun in just the same way women are beaten by their husbands. But it happened that the moon was one of those short tempered women who fight their husbands. When she was beaten, she fought back and wounded the sun's forehead. The sun also beat the moon and scratched her face and plucked out one of her eyes. When the sun realized that he was wounded, he was very embarrassed and said to himself, I'm going to shine so hard that people will not be able to look at me. And so he shone so hard that people could not look at him without squinting. That is why the sun shines so brightly. As for the moon, she did not feel any embarrassment. And so she did not have to shine any brighter. And even now, if you look closely at the moon, you will see the wounds that the sun inflicted on her during their fight. It was a, a, an interesting, um, I'm trying to curry favor with the feminists who might be in the audience. Uh, the, the, the image on the right-hand side came from Pinterest. I couldn't find out who the original artist is because it's, it's a, obviously a touched up image of the moon. On the left, um, but Dave Hoskin gave me a picture of, you can see the sunspots on the sun. Sunspots can be seen with the naked eye under some conditions. And this has been recorded now for a couple of thousand years at different intervals. Uh, so I sorry, uh, 2003, that one sunspot that was about 28 times the size of the Earth was visible. It was visible. And, and, it, and it usually is dependent upon the weather when it's, when it's like hazy, when we have a fog, some light cloud, and perhaps the sun's down near the horizon. So I, I suspect that was, those were the stars that the, that the sun was trying to heal. So. Mm -hmm. yes. um, in this case, uh, looking at the history, so there's Albertus Magnus, sort of Albert the Great. Um, he was a theologian, naturalist, um, historian who lived 1200 to 1280 about. Um, and he wrote about, you could see a dragon, a tree and a man in the moon, right? So kind of a sad story here on the, on the drawings part, but um, that gives you the idea. Now, also read that Shakespeare had said that there was a dog, a bush, and a man. And this was attributed to Summer's Night's Dream. So I went to the Summer's Night Dream, but it talks about a thorn bush, a man, and a lantern. So anyway, but nonetheless, figures in the moon, so. Uh, this is a, uh, a chapel in Italy by Giotto, 1305, a long time ago. Um, I'm, the, the details we're interested in are up here, either side of the, of the arched window. Next slide, please. And so on the left, we have the sun, kind of a sphere with radiant lights. And over on the right, we have a moon face. Now, that chapel was about 28, 30 feet wide. And so these things would have been pretty small. I would, they're certainly less than, a, less than a foot in diameter, but then nonetheless, they're there. Another artwork, this is a little smaller. These are, are uh, these are painted on wood. They're about 18 inches high. Uh, this is Jan van Eyck. Um, so this again, medieval period 13. He lived 1390 and 1441. 1441 is, I think, when they attribute this to him. And uh, so at 18 inches high, and I'll have the next slide, please. So here's, here's two details. So 
on the on the one case we have we have the moon shown next to the crucifix and I've, I've again enlarged it there and it's um, sort of a face and, and it certainly is the artist obviously observed the moon um, and you know potentially there's a, a, a face there I tend to see it more here now interestingly enough when I, I, I sort of scale that wooden panel and that's about that would be about half an inch in diameter in reality, which is be what what you what you would see, and you could cover these little thing yourself. Which is interesting. So Leonardo had there's I guess two locations of where he sort of drawn a face of the moon. These are are um, in his in his notebooks. Um, this is a pen and ink one where the moon on the paper is about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And then over on another one, we have so, sort of a, a half of the moon, but I, I'm thinking that's a face in there. And that's about seven inches in diameter in reality. Um, the woodcutter in the moon. So in both um, Christian and Jewish faiths, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And the woodcutter was collecting wood on the Sabbath, possibly stealing wood on the Sabbath. Um, anyway, was confronted and was to be and was punished by being placed on the moon for all of us to see. This is not a face, but it's by William Gilbert. He was Queen Elizabeth the first um, astronomer, and he made a, a drawing. This is just pre telescope um, uh, of features that he saw on the moon. Um, he named them, including calling them things like. Mare and Sinus. Um, and he was interested to see, he wanted to know whether anybody else had drawn the moon previous to him to see if there had been any changes in terms of, of the, the, the appearance of the moon. So, anyway, um, I thought that was interesting. After this, we, we got into telescopes. So, um, there are a couple of modern, call it modern moons, if you will, in here. One of them is by Cassini. Um, he did this 1679. He had a, uh, his telescopes were like 20 feet plus long. Um, he's doing, he was an Italian working in Paris. Um, and in this case, he, he was very visible. This is apparently quite a high in terms of qualities of the maps of the moon. This was probably the highest at the time. And he drew this. And he had two artists who helped him, and then it, and there was an engraving done. It's about uh, 22 inches, by well, 22 is the, the page size, if you will. But what's kind of fun about this is the fact that this is in the Sea of Serenity, we, we have this figure with a line through it, and that looks a bit like a heart. It's also kind of like the Greek letter phi, which is the first, word, first letter in uh, phylos, which means love or affection. I'll have this next slide. And there's another detail, which is where they think that this is, is modeled after Cassini's wife, who would be married to for three or four years, I think, while they were when they were drawing that. So anyway, I thought it was nice that there was a little romance um, in the moon, and it was kind of cleverly put in there. In uh, over here in North America. So the, the, the image here is on the on the left hand side is we have an image of the moon and it has a, a creature which is which is considered to be a, a woman. The the artwork um, and the page is, is dated 1883, and it has it tells the story of a girl who went to get water at night, and then and she, then she stuck her tongue out at the moon. The moon was annoyed. So he grabbed her, she grabbed some grass, and she was dragged it off and put in the moon. Um, and then we have essentially the same retelling in a, in a, a newspaper clipping, and it's hand dated 1887. So the story goes back a ways. On the right hand side is very nice um, um, sort of pendant that uh, Bill Reed made uh, here in Canada. And I'll have the next slide, please. And this is a video I came across on Vimeo, and it's a story about, about the, the woman in the moon, um, the, the woman telling the story. And I, 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 re I recommend it. It's good at entertainment, and she has some other ones on, on YouTube. Um, she has a, she has a, a button um, blanket or shawl there. 
that her great grandmother made, which makes it about 100 years old. Anyway, it looks pretty much the same as what we saw in 1887 and what Bill Reed does. So it's, it's, you know, if that's a living part of their heritage, I think he would co probably call her um, a knowledge keeper. And this, their story there is that <clears throat> there is a, a woman who's uh, very important in her village, in her Haida village. This is in Haida Gwaii. Um, and in, <clears throat> in Haida Gwaii, she was um, very important in the village because of her, of her, of her spirit and her wonderful singing. So she was appreciated everybody. She brightened everybody's day. So one day she goes off to pick berries because the berry season is about to end. The rest of the village has gone down to the river because the salmon are running and they're harvesting the salmon to get food for the winter. So as she goes, she sings and she sings particularly when she's up in the, in the berry field because there's a couple of bears there and you're supposed to sing and then the bears will leave you alone, which they do. So she's singing away Meanwhile, the moon is watching her. It's during the day, so she can't see the moon, but he's watching. And mankind was, was new to this earth. And he was seeing that how she had such a great voice and how the people in her village were uplifted by her, her songs and her presence. And he thought that really the rest of the world really needed someone like her to help their spirits. And so he reached down and he, and he grabs her without telling, again, um, he's, she, she's abducted, um, and she has with her, she has her, her, her bucket, and she grabs some berry bushes, and the moon just pulls her, and she just rips out the berry bushes, and she's taken up, and she's put on the moon. Meanwhile, back in her village, the people come home, they say, well, where, where is J.D.? That's the, the woman who went, <clears throat> is now on the moon, and uh, they can't find her. And they're, they're kind of upset. They go to the berry patch. They can trace her footprints, and then the footprints just disappear. So anyway, no sign of her. For several days, they search for her, and there's much crying and lamenting. Meanwhile, on the moon, J.D., the woman, is kind of shouting out to them, but they can't hear her because they're all up, so I'm all so upset. Anyway, on the fourth day, just as the moon is rising, she looks and she realizes she has the berry bushes with her. So she 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 takes the berries. And then she casts them into the sky, and they become um, they become little bright lights. And then and the people down below look up and they see all these bright lights, which would be the stars. Right? This is a creation story, I guess. And they say, "Oh my God! Look at all look look at all these bright lights! Isn't that wonderful?" And then they look up and they can see the woman on the moon. And then they're quiet. And then when they listen quietly, they can hear. So that's that's the uh, the highest story. Jerry, I'll take the next one. Okay, so here's here's some. You may not be happy that I'm showing you this one. Um, this comes from um, Cloudy Nights, and the the author and artist of this, Stephen Saber, uh, astronomer, bodybuilder, um, interesting guy. Guy does a lot of outreach, and one of the things he wanted to do was give people something that they would help them remember the various um, mare and features that are on the moon. So he, he made up a story of Jack and the mutant uh, beaver, okay? And Jack is the Jack and Jack and Jill. And there is a story about Jack and Jill being on the moon, but I couldn't find Jack and Jill on the moon in the patterns. Um, but anyway, Jack and Jill went up on the moon. Um, Jill's around the backside. She sent Jack to the front. He bumps into the mutant beaver who's been sentenced there because of some, some, uh, some bad deeds he did with the Greek gods. And he's, and he's been making up astronomy jokes and inflicts them on Jack. Um, anyway, but so having seen this pattern, now when I look at any large photo of the moon, I tend to see the moon. Anyway. Um, so anyway, so I don't know whether you're going to carry that little earworm with you when you leave, but we'll see. <laughs> um, in terms of references, I often go to the Beyond the Blue Horizon. Um, Dr. Krupp, which I think you met Dr. Krupp, I think, Dave, did you? Mm -hmm. Down in uh, He's Los, a Los Angeles? He's of uh, Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, and uh, which is not a professional observatory. It's an outreach observatory that was paid for and then built by the philanthropist Griffith in Griffith Park, anyway. Uh, Ed Krupp has been the director. 
forever. Yeah. I, I mean, it's and, and if, if you're not sure if you've seen uh, Griffith Observatory, it's in a lot of movies, movies yeah. like uh, Rebel Without a Cause, and uh, more most recently Terminator Genesis, okay. where when he comes down and materializes this thing. But there we go. So there's inspiration for what we'll do the rest of the weekend. He's a, he's a cool guy. Yeah. So he's written several books. This book often has a, a lot, slightly longer version of, of many stories that I find elsewhere. And uh, you know, Rona, the, the tide control for New Zealand, um, really comes from her, but mentioned in a number of places, including for some stories that were recorded a long time ago in New Zealand. Um, Atlas of the Moon um, had talked about rabbits and like how you could find them. Um, Stephen James O'Meara uh, had some stuff on a little bit about moons. Next one, please, Jerry. Um, the Mapping and Naming the Moon, Whitaker, is quite a, an, an interesting book. He talks about the, the history, all the names, um, but he has a little section at the beginning about the figures that you find on the moon, and he has some illustrations that I thought I could do better than, you know, maybe better. Anyway, but and uh, he mentioned a couple of stories which I then chased through the internet and the books and things. Rabbit on the Face is about um, Mesoamerica. This is um, pre Columbian. Um, that's where the, the, the story about the uh, you know, Aztec gods who were creating the suns. They, they've got two suns and they throw a rabbit in one of them, so it comes to the moon. Moon lore, um, Reverend T. Harley, 1885, has a lot of stories. The little image of the woodcutter uh, that you saw um, came from that book, and that's available on gutenberg.org, so you can get to you can, you know, see what's there, quite a lot of stuff. And here we are. We're at the end of the presentation. And I'd like to thank you for your at attention. And uh, uh, just to drive the point home about the beaver. Um, okay. Thought I thought I'd finish with that. So anyway, thank you. If, if, if anyone's interested in any of these stories, the, the references are generally on if you go on the slide. Um, you know, so that if you if you watch it later when it gets uh, put on YouTube, find it. Or if you want a um, kind of a hard copy or something, then I, I'd be more than happy to uh, to send it to you. Anyway, any stories or comments, or maybe someone's got a better, got a good story that they want to tell? No? Well, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Um, not sure how long that was, but probably a while. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. I'm glad to see that forever now. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we're going to have our. Uh, 15 minute break now. So uh, if you're in Zoom land, take a cup of coffee, have a snack. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, back on to the second part of the members meeting, and uh, this is the members' presentations. And we'll start with uh, Dave Chapman talking okay. about uh, his new book. Okay, um, I'm going to try to keep give a, a, a little advertisement for the book. Uh, and then I thought that I, because there were so many people here, I would uh, say a bit more about myself on the book. And now when I get up to speak, I recognize that those people are no longer here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there are people in Zoom land that probably have. People in Zoom land, hello. <laughs> Okay, I'll say a bit about myself because this is, we're now segueing into the members part, right? So I'll, I'll say a bit about myself and uh, and my project, and uh, and then I'll finish off by plugging the book. I'll hold it up while I talk. Um, so okay, my name is David Chapman. I've been an amateur astronomer. I just figured out today it was it's been like sixty two years that I since I first went out and saw the stars with my father as an eight year old. Uh, so I've been doing this, been at this game for quite a while, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, done. Uh, you know, I've been a member of the RASE for uh, on and off since 1968, uh, and I'm currently a fellow of the RASC. I've done quite a lot of uh, projects with the RASC, including uh, serving this center plus 
national uh, things. Um, so if people are interested in finding out more about what I've done, because I can't talk about everything, I have a thing called a link tree. And if you link tree Dave Chapman, uh, you will see all the things that I'm involved in. So most recently, I guess, like the last couple of years, uh, well, for the past 10 years, I've been working with uh, a younger Indigenous lady, a First Nations lady named Kathy LeBlanc, who I met at uh, Kejimkujik National Park National Historic Site when we were setting up the Dark Sky Preserve. And she was one of the Mi'kmaq cultural interpreters there. And uh, we got to working together. We worked pretty well together doing things like the Dark Sky Weekend and uh, uh, preparing the uh, annual guide to the park and things like that. And then one year she uh, asked me if I would help with a, a special project talking about the moon to the Acadia First Nation people. And she said, I want you to come and explain all about you know, the, the moon. And uh, she wanted the, you know, me to also talk about the indigenous aspect of it. I said, you know, I, I can't do that. I said, that would be wrong. I'll, I'll tell you about the astronomy. But I said, if we're going to do this, I think we need to do this together. And uh, so that was quite a while ago, uh, I would say, getting on for 10 years. And uh, uh, so that started a, a long sort of steady process of working on uh, talking about the moon from the Indigenous perspective and the scientific perspective. And then we started doing presentations. Uh, and we called our project Mi'kmaq Moons. And in a nutshell, the indigenous view of uh, the moons is that more or less 12 times a year, there's a full moon and the Mi'kmaq have a name for the moon, uh, which has some connection with what's going on in nature around them. So for instance, uh, there's a frog's croaking moon in the spring and there's a trees fully leaved moon in the summer and so on. And so we started uh, presenting that material and uh, from time to time there was nece necessary to talk about the astronomy of the moon, particularly when it comes to uh, the uh, requirement every so often to have a 13th moon, which I don't have time to talk about. Over time, we started talking, writing, and we eventually we were asked by Format Publishing to if we were interested in writing a book, well, we had that in the back of our mind, but it wasn't an active uh, goal until they came and asked us and invited us to write something. And that took a few years to sort out. It's been about a year. What's the date today? Okay, well, the book came out on the 24th. So it's almost a year old now. And it's been quite a success. We've been sold quite a few. I think 4,000 have been printed and distributed, and I think there's another printing. It's been recently nominated for an award, um, a children's uh, nonfiction award, so we're pretty excited about that. So all the different times of year have different um, uh, different names, as I mentioned. And so what the, at the core of our book are 12 stories. And there are conversations between Auntie, who is Kathy, and her real life niece, Holly. So they, we call them the Holly and Auntie stories. So each, each moon time, uh, there's a story. And there are in four groups. So there's also stories about uh, the, um, the seasons. And um, so each, so this is a typical spread. So there's a story here, which is the Holly and Auntie story. And the facing page has some beautiful art by our illustrator, Loretta Gould, who is a Mi'kmaq illustrator. She's pretty well known. She has a big installation out at the airport. How am I doing for time? Can I use up my 10 minutes yet? <laughs> I think we have lots of time. Dude. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, normally, normally Kathy, uh, appears with me and I get her to read the story. So this is the first chance I get to read a story out of the book. So bear with me, I'll read you the story for uh, 
we gave you goose, which is animal fattening time. So this is the equivalent in Myanmar of uh, hunter's moon, okay? People talk about hunter's moon, well, Myanmar call it animal fattening time. It's when the animals are getting ready for, for winter and they're eating a lot of stuff and getting fat and slow and they're easy to hunt and so forth. So it's in other traditions, hunter's moon. So here's the story that uh, we wrote. <clears throat> One sunny fall day, Holly and her auntie went for a walk along one of their favorite woodland paths. The smell of fallen leaves was in the air, and Holly kicked the leaves as they walked. Look at those silly squirrels running around and jumping from tree to tree, Holly cried out. Those squirrels are searching for food. They need to fatten up for the cold days ahead, explained auntie. It's Wigewigus, animal fattening time. Ah, that makes sense, said Holly. What kind of food do squirrels eat? Now, editor comment here, the publisher wanted us to put in all of these like natural history things so we could check off the box on the Nova Scotia curriculum. I said, we, we're not naturalists, but you know, we did all the research. What kind of food do squirrels eat? So Dave gets on, you know, Google and start reading about squirrels. I like squirrels. I have them in my yard and uh, my Cuban friend asked me, What's a squirrel? I don't know what a squirrel was. I said, imagine a rat with a furry tail. That's a squirrel. Okay. Um, hey, they're back. Yes, they are. And now back to your regularly scheduled channel. Uh, almost. Yeah, looks like they're connect connecting. Good deal. Oh, Halifax host, connected audio. But they're muted. Here, and I finished the story, and now I'm going to sit down. Well, well, they, they, they have to buy your book, book if they want. Buy the book. Oh, you, the yes. Story. I was. I, <laughs> you, you, you missed this commercial break. You can buy this from <laughs> me. Uh, just contact me. Twenty five dollars. There's a way you can pay by e deposit. And if you don't live close to me or Kathy, I can send it to you for another six bucks in the mail. Thank you for watching and listening. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll we'll do one. I think mean, you have one, Jerry. Oh, I I could do one. But... Yeah, you do. I'll quick one, and you can do one. Okay. Um, just put yeast. I got a little. Just, I'm frame. going to ask yeah. uh, John. Uh, can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. And you can see us all right. All right, good. I'm not quite sure what we're recording, but we're recording something. <laughs> okay, uh, a, a couple quick uh, book recommendations. Uh, I picked these up earlier in the year. And uh, one, uh, The Moon, Ancient Myths to Colonies of Tomorrow, uh, fits in well with uh, Chris's uh, presentation. This is a great one um, because it's full of kind of like one to two page vignettes. So it's a good uh, read before you go to sleep uh, book. You don't have to uh, spend a lot of time on it, but uh, it covers everything from uh, oh, uh, how some of the craters formed to uh, some history, uh, the trial of this uh, ancient Greek, Ready the Moon. First liquid-fueled liquid fueled rocket, the uh, lunar prospecting. So fun, fun book, well worth reading. And the other one uh, is 100 Things to See in the Night Sky. Do you want to bring that close to the camera? Yeah. See that? 100 Things to See in the Night Sky. Um, and it covers uh, the 100 things or constellations, stars, planets, satellites, uh, nebulae. Um, again, uh, fairly short articles, uh, two, three pages long and uh, well-written. Uh, good, uh, good book for, uh, you know, uh, seasoned amateur astronomers or beginners. Lots of interesting stuff in there. Some good stories as well regarding the constellations. If you want to talk about those in outreach. And the uh, last thing I want to talk about briefly is this little thing. Um, 
So the Dwarf II Mini Robotic Telescope that I picked up uh, last spring, and I've been using it to, uh, for my own uh, uh, fun, but also for outreach. Uh, basically, it, it's, uh, it has a wide angle uh, camera and a telephoto camera, one inch aperture. Um, they claim it's got a, uh, some ED glass in it, but there's still a chromatic aberration around some of the brighter stars. Um, but you cover, you uh, control it with your um, cell phone or tablet. Uh, it runs in Android and iOS, and uh, it takes some pretty decent pictures. Uh, it comes in a really good quality case. I got the deluxe version, which came with uh, solar filters and uh, a UHC filter. I bought a, a, a dual band filter to, to su supplement those the uh, filters that came with it. And uh, comes with its own tripod, which is frankly not very good. It's the, the better quality tripod. Um, but it records uh, it's the images that it's taking um, in real time. So you can, you can uh, it stacks in real time. So you can view the image building up on your uh, camera or, or your, your um, tablet uh, over uh, the course of uh, maximum exposures, 15, min 15 second exposures. So you know, a couple minutes and you build up a, a pretty decent image. Um, <laughs> it, it saves that stacked image, but it also saves the uh, FITS files from the individual frames. So you can go on and download those those FITS files to your computer, put them in PixInsight or Serial or you know, whatever your favorite astrophotography program is, stack them and uh, and get an even better image out of it. Um, for me, the, the the beauty of it is the simplicity. So what I tend to do is, is just take the stacked image off, which it also saves off the SD card and uh, you know, tweak it a bit in, in Photoshop. And that's the image that, that, uh, that I end up keeping. How many images would you typically stack? Um, you get a pretty decent image uh, if you stack, let's say 50 to 60. Uh, 15 second exposures. Uh, if you go to the Facebook page that the uh, users, Dwarf 2 users have, um, you can see some pretty impressive images, but they're stacking uh, six, 700, 800 exposures that they've gathered over a couple nights. Um, the The drawback is that it's all that, so you get field rotation. Uh, there are um, uh, mounts, uh, Sort of we're looking for instructions, I guess. Uh, you can download for a 3D printer, which strengthen the base and, and then allow you can do a polar alignment with this, and then you get rid of the field rotation. Even a very rough polar alignment gets rid of most of the field rotation. Mm -hmm. um, it's good for uh, uh, you know, larger objects, uh, takes a Decent uh, image of the moon, the sun with sunspots, with the solar filters that it comes with. Um, and it can be used in the daytime for a nature photography. I've taken some pretty decent pictures of birds at the bird feeder, and it'll track uh, the movement of, a, of an animal or, or birds as well. So a fun little toy. Uh, if you're interested, I wrote a review on it uh, for Nova Notes, I think, last spring. So go through uh, the our archives, dig up an old copy of Nova Notes, and, and uh, I'll, it says a little bit more about it. But I think I paid, uh, it's currently selling for about uh, 500 US dollars. So not, not too, too expensive if, if you want to start to dabble in astrophotography. How did it compare to the ZWO Star? Ah, <laughs> okay. Uh, Jerry asked about the ZWO Star, which is, which is a competitor that came out from... Uh, well-known astro uh, camera maker ZWO. And um, actually the two of them, I think complement each other because the uh, dwarf um, has a shorter focal length. It's great for larger images. Uh, galaxies are pretty tiny on it, except for Andromeda. The sea star has a longer focal length. So it, it gives you a, a it's better for smaller objects like galaxies, globular clusters, and so on. 
Um, the quality, I think the quality of the image is pretty comparable. Um, I've seen some of the sea star images and they're very, about as noisy as the dwarf star. It's not, they're not perfect. Um, the big difference between the two is the current software that the sea star runs is more mature, which I think reflects the fact that it, it's made by a company that knows how to do um, astrophotography with their cameras. They have some software that's uh, available, uh, which uh, takes the place of SharpCap, for example, or, or uh, what's it, Fire Capture? Um, the software for this still needs some work, but there's an update coming out in November, which uh, should be a lot better. So, so I, I'm certainly happy with the purchase. Um, I may buy a C-Star <laughs> to complement it, but, uh, you know, it, uh, it all fits in this, you know, so every, you know, take it on an airplane. <laughs> you don't have to worry about your, your gear getting smashed by the baggage handlers. You just about the size of a, a DSLR camera bag. You're set to go. Lisa wanted to see the whole company. Oh. Here you go, Lisa. Good book. Highly recommend it. And the author again? The author is David Warmflat. Thank you. Should I? Uh... Yeah, sure. So, as all of you are avid astrophotographers, I know you'll recognize this uh, right away. Uh, so those of you who aren't, uh, this is called a, a flip flap. Why would you have a flip flap? It's a USB control device that fits on the end of your telescope. And uh, for those of you who don't like staying up to the very end of your photography session and then uh, covering your scope to take dark images. So you, part of, a, part of the process typically is to uh, uh, take your light exposures, uh, as many as you can or want to, and then at the end, take some dark exposures to uh, measure the noise inherent in the, in the sensor of the camera. So this under computer control will, uh, normally it's in the open position, <laughs> closed here now, uh, will close and then uh, uh, you can, take your darks. It also has a built-in LED in here uh, that can be turned on and illuminated and take your flat images. So the second part of the what you might want to do in addition to taking pictures is to take a, a flat frame of, of the blue sky normally uh, during the day. But here, this is uh, uniform illumination, so you can take it at the same time, same temperature uh, of your original imaging. So uh, now, under computer control, the scenario is I ask it to take uh, uh, 25 20 minute exposures or 20 minute, 20 20 minute exposures. At the end of that, I will be asleep. Uh, and I'll uh, just then ask it to take, you know, 10 darks at 20 minutes and then uh, switch to uh, uh, 10, 10 flats, which would normally be about one second exposure. The software will figure out what the right exposure is for the flat because it's pretty bright, right? It doesn't need that much exposure. And then it can, will, will in fact, uh, you just say, well, take dark flats as well after that. So it, it then knows what exposure it was using for the flats, uses that same exposure to the darks to match the flats. So you end up with a total of four sets of, of, of images that you typically combine with, with uh, your software to end up with the final image. Anyway, it, it's uh, a luxury. You can, you can get by without it, but uh, it is nice to be able to sleep at night and wake up in the morning and uh, have it all done. <clears throat> Okay. Thanks, Harry. Okay. Uh, how much did it cost? <laughs> I don't remember, Judy. Well, <laughs> 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 it's nice to sleep. As someone who does get up to uh, 
take darks and, and flats in the middle of the night. Right. right. See, the, see the attraction. Uh, so uh, next up is uh, uh, Food for the Soul, Paul Heath. Are we good? Uh, as, as most of you know, the weather's been really great for observing. <laughs> so, but we, during the daytime, we've had some spectacular uh, rainbows uh, all over the province and, and uh, that. So uh, the poem today is based on the fact we had, what, four sightings in two days of, of full-size rainbows and that. So I figured I'd, I'd do something up about the rainbow and that. Uh, and uh, with Roy's advice uh, from his email, I went to the handbook to read <laughs> read a bit on the rainbows before I did my poems. Pot of gold. Upon the sky it rests, vibrant and strong, fixed against the passing storm. Each vision a storm's passion reflects. Held upon the eye for each their own piece of wonder. Soundless it shines, unless by surprise it has appeared. Fleeting it rushes before the sun, bringing joy after turmoil, bringing calm, bringing wonder, bringing a child's hope. Ah, does not your eye rush to the wonder's end? Does it not seek that glittering reflection, the sound of coins falling on coins? But a child's hopes shows rarely. Only when the storm's passion is severe and wonder has doubled upon the air will child's hope touch upon the earth and gold's glitter be revealed. But wait, it's not each coin within the pot, but a wonder placed upon or placed within your eye and kept safe deep within one's mind. Is that right? As, as Roy uh, is, is often to say, we never really see something. It's all up here. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we'll do uh, what's up in October. Now we're almost at the end of October, so uh, some of this is uh, maybe old news, um, but some isn't. So next slide. Uh, days are getting quite a bit longer. Um, by the end of the month, we'll have 10 and a half hours of darkness. So great for the astroimagers and the uh, observers. Next, please. Uh, this is the sun today. Uh, sun's fairly quiet. There's a, there's a few sunspot groups. Uh, none of them are huge. Um, I think we had a, 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 a coronal mass ejection side slip here a couple of days ago. But it was Is that the one from 64? Yeah, I think it's 64, yeah. But the, the clouds, uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone around here was able to see it. Well, the ones in the airplane. Yes, yeah, the ones in the airplane, yeah, exactly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the moon this month. Um, so we got a new moon October 14th. Um, Tomorrow is the first quarter. Um, I think it's going to be cloudy tomorrow night as well, uh, but the peak of the Orionid meteor showers uh, is tomorrow night. Uh, on the 28th, it's the full moon, the river's uh, freezing over. And on the also on the 28th, uh, the moon and Jupiter are close together. Nice uh, image through binoculars. And we have a partial lunar eclipse, but uh, from Halifax, we can only see the penumbral stage. Um, so you won't see much, maybe a, a very slight darkening uh, if the skies are clear. If you're in Cape Breton, um, you may see part of the, uh, of the, of the actual eclipse. Uh, this was a, Really nice uh, site, October 3rd, start of the month. Hopefully some, some people got up early enough to see this. The uh, moon and very close to the uh, Seven Sisters of Ladies and uh, quite a nice uh, binocular site. Uh, 
we also had an annular solar eclipse on the 14th, so a week ago. Uh, Halifax was pretty much clouded over, but uh, a few of our members got nice pictures. I saw Jerry got a, a picture of, of the, the peak where about 10% of the disc was covered. Jason Dane got a, another nice picture. Uh, you go online, Alan Dyer uh, uh, traveled to the states, so I forget where he went, Mexico. Anyway, you, Texas, Texas, yeah, you went went to the the path and uh, caught the whole eclipse right from right from sunrise. So that, that's an image well worth looking at. Uh, this this was what it was viewed, and this is the partial lunar eclipse uh, that uh, that we're going to see. So as I said, uh, only a penum penumbral stage will be visible for us, and if you're in Cape Breton. Uh, you'll see some of the partial eclipse. Uh, if you're doing uh, the uh, Explore the Universe program or Explore the Moon program uh, from RASC, uh, these are some of the targets to uh, have a look for. And uh, the best time uh, to look at the Moon for most of these targets will be around uh, the 20th to the 24th. Uh, that's when uh, when the, the Terminator is going to be situated so that you'll see uh, craters in, in, in good detail due to the casting of shadows. Uh, planets this month. Uh, Mercury, uh, pretty hard to see. Uh, currently, it, it's very, it, it, it's not visible. At the start of the month, it was very low on the uh, eastern horizon of the pre-dawn sky. Uh, Venus, if you're up before sunrise, you can't miss it. It's uh, very prominent in the eastern morning sky. And on the 23rd, it'll okay. have its greatest western elongation. Uh, Mars is too close to the sun to be visible. Um, this month is a good good time to uh, look for zodiacal light uh, starting October 13th, uh, just before dawn. Uh, you really need dark skies, and uh, you can't have really the moon in the sky. You want to, you want to see the zodiacal light. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are uh, visible now in the uh, evening. Jupiter uh, rising uh, after sunset, and Saturn is uh, well above the eastern horizon uh, in evening twilight. Uh, Jupiter will be close to the full moon, as I said, on October 28th, and Saturn close to the moon on the 23rd and the 24th. Uranus is visible for most of the night. Uh, look uh, in the area of Aries and Taurus. And Neptune, uh, currently in Pisces, is also visible for most of the night. So uh, a good time to see the outer, uh, uh, outer gas giants. Uh, this is uh, the view through um, standard 10 by uh, 50 binoculars on the 28th, so uh, the Moon and Jupiter. And uh, this is what pre-dawn zodiacal light looks like. Uh, the picture I showed that Barry Burgess got was much better than the one I, I did, but he had to work harder for it. I just went out to show my head. <laughs> Go back, uh, David. Yes. Uh, in the... The moon Jupiter uh, arrangement. Yes. Is one of those dots maybe Uranus? Yeah, it should be between. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, yeah. I'm getting mixed up because I'm also reviewing stuff that happens next year. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm anyway. not sure. Anyway, go to Stellarium. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can find out. Uh, autumn constellations for exploring the universe uh, Pegasus, Andromeda, Cassiopeia, Perseus, and Aries. Uh, so, uh, you know, just after, uh, well, when the skies are getting dark around nine o'clock, it's going to be quite dark. Uh, this is what uh, you'll see if you look towards the east. You need to identify these constellations for, as part of exploring the universe. Next slide. And autumn stars. Uh, Mirfak uh, is the uh, 35th brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere um, in the uh, constellation Perseus. 
Next slide, please. All right. Oh. Uh, autumn deep sky objects. Uh, there's uh, three of them I've highlighted from uh, Explore the Universe. Um, this month, the one that, that I'm drawing attention to is the lot 20 or the Alpha Persei cluster. It's an open star cluster in Perseus, and mere fact is the most luminous member of that cluster, as shown, shown here. It's a mere fact, it's a cluster. Quite a nice binocular target. Um, other autumn deep sky objects are the double cluster and Andromeda galaxy. Next slide. And uh, double stars for Explore the Universe. Uh, this is a, a fairly easy one. Um, alpha 1 and Alpha 2 uh, Capricorni. Uh, these are uh, optical double, uh, a nice binocular target. Um, both of them have a, a yellow color. Uh, alpha 2 Capricorni is a, a yellow giant. And Alpha 1 is a yellow supergiant. So that's where you'll, you'll find them. And uh, Saturn is, is a good uh, good marker to, to know whether you're to easily find Saturn in the sky. You'll know you're in the uh, right vicinity of Capricornus, even, even if you're in the city. And uh, that's it for this month. Hopefully, next month, well, so you, Bieber. it'll be better. Oh, you, Bieber. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Yeah. yeah, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's what's up in the uh, night sky for this month. Uh, and uh, we're going to now move to uh, news from the board with Peter Hurley. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, David. Uh, we've lost a lot of our crowd, both here and online. And so I think everybody here knows me. I introduced myself to Neil, so I won't introduce myself again. Um, so our, our most recent board meeting was last Tuesday, October 17th, and I drew a short spot on board for presenting the uh, notes, new, news from the board. Um, oh. Go back to the slide. Maybe more. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. That was it. Okay. All right. Um, missing the slide. Sco is open, but that's at the end. That's at the end. That's okay. at the end. Oh, well, Sco is open, but access is limited. Um, uh, because of the, the, the the rain and the flooding in the summer, the penstock that carried water from the dam, which is above SCO, or upstream from SCO, carries water down to the um, generating station of the highway. Um, that penstock was uh, destroyed. Um, I wish I brought photos. Um, penstock looked like, to me, it looked like pickup savings. Um, so uh, minus energy is replacing the penstock. Right now, the access road um, is a construction site. The bridge just inside of the gate has been removed temporarily. And um, that road, they're advising that um, cars with low clearance probably shouldn't use the road at the moment, but a car with high clearance or an SUV or a truck um, should be all right. Um, They've apologized for any inconvenience and they hope to have the road, sorry, the, yes, the road repaired, construction finished by the end of the month. Um, while we're talking about SCO, I'd like to thank um, John Lagarde and Tony McGrath for all the work they did this summer. John broke his arm and Tony stepped in and arranged the work parties and the painting parties that, that happened this year. And I'd like to thank Bob and Bob Russell and Jerry Black for getting us back into hybrid reading mode. Um, yeah. Um, oh, okay. 
2024 RAS calendars are here. Um, actually, the box sitting over there. Uh, we only ordered 20 this year because we ordered 30 last year and we had seven left over. If you want a copy of the 2023 calendar, you can probably have it for free. But for calendar this year, um, okay. $25 per calendar if you pick them up here or if they're mailed locally. Um, if you're mailing to a US address, it's $30 per calendar. Um, payment by uh, check or money order to Greg or to yeah, e transfer. Or e transfer, it works to Greg at treasurer at halifax.rasp.ca. Provide your name and mailing address in the notes. Um, Greg receives the payment and Judy will mail it out if that's how it's been, how you're going to get it, or you can pick it up here. Uh, I think, Jerry, are you accepting cash? $25 that's cash. Fine. I'll look after that. Okay, perfect. Great, here. Um, I, I just checked and it's, it's $30 and change. If you try to order one from from RASP this year, they, it's a little bit better deal than last year. They they fixed whether whatever problem they have with um, with their postal rate. Um, next members meeting is November four. Guest speaker is Tim Doucette to tell us about his trip to the Canada France Hawaii telescope. Um, Following meeting is September 2nd. Our speaker is a new member, John Badowski, who's going to speak to us about Crystal Rule and the Canals of Mars. Um, that is also the um, our AGM, which will be held immediately before the members meeting. Um, I urge you all to please attend and participate. Um, one of the things that happens with the AGM is selection of, of board. Um, Nominations for board positions are open now, and um, uh, nominations close uh, November 2nd, as stipulated by our bylaws. Uh, and we wanted to remind everyone that the SMU McLennan <laughs> Memorial Lecture <laughs> is in astronomy is on November 2nd, 2023. 20, uh, Ticketing is now available online. Uh, where, where do you go? Uh, I had a slide. Oh, there you are. If you um, go to the SMU Faculty of Science events webpage, or if you just Google or use your browser, um, SMU and Lecture 2023, it'll take you to that science faculty um, website and that book your tickets now is, is hot. It's click on that, it takes you to Eventbrite. There, there's no transaction fee, which is nice. A lot of times when you go to Eventbrite, it wants two or three dollars for the transaction fee. There is no transaction fee. Um, I, I booked my ticket a couple days ago. Um, the speaker is Christine um, Speckens. I think SMU has been great at, at getting wonderful speakers. Um, she's going to be speaking about the SKA. I didn't have a clue what that was. It's the square kilometer array. Um, it should be exciting. Um, the next slide, I think, has a, that's a, a crazy of, of the presentation. We can leave that up for you to read it for a minute. Okay. Yeah, so the AGM um, election of, of board happens. Um, there are 10 positions on the board with four executive positions and six directors. Um, anyone can, can you know, volunteer and nominate themselves. Uh, um, we're still, uh, I'm the chair of the nominating committee, and we're still waiting to hear from existing board members who is interested in staying on. Um, but also personally, if anyone would like to volunteer to be secretary, um, that would be great. 
Um, you say our, our, our bylaws require um, nominations to close 30 days before the AGM. So nominations will close on November 2nd, but they will open again the day of the AGM, just before the elections. Um, you can find the, the, the procedures, um, this G6 procedures regarding nominations, elections, and and appointments on the central website under policy documents. Um, that's under the about us page. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can send me an email, um, secretary at halifax.rasc.ca. Um, next slide. Those are the appointed positions. The, those are not elected positions. The, at the first meeting of the new board, the incoming board in January, they will make appointments to all of these positions. It's just to let you know what those are. And if you're interested in participating, volunteering, um, let me or another board member know. Um, I think, great. We need an auditor for this year, don't we? Yeah, I think so. Well, okay, so. <laughs> so, if anybody knows someone that we could use as an auditor, please um, let Greg or me know. Uh, you can get Greg as treasurer at halifax.rasc.ca. Yeah, and we have lost this, it powers off. Okay. After a certain amount of time, and it will take a little while for you know, to turn it back. Are we still on Zoom? We're still on Zoom. We should be, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyone that that's out there on, on Zoom is still hearing this. Um, if you're interested in in um, any of these positions, just send me uh, an email at um, secretary at Um and Mary Lou, next time around or in the announce list, I will do a, a better job of making work with the board and on the committees uh, a little more interesting, a little sexier. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, those are the notes from the board. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Peter. Uh, so that brings us to the end of uh, the meeting. Um, so. Uh, as Peter said, the next meeting is uh, first Saturday in November, not too far away. Have a good uh, couple of weeks and uh, keep your fingers crossed that the skies stay clear for us, or at least more clear than they have been. Thanks all and goodbye. Thank you. Hey, if you want calendars, I'll be right there. <laughs>